Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to worship this morning, whether you're here live, whether you're watching on stream, or whether you're watching this at some time in the future. So whenever and wherever you are, you're most welcome to our Harvest Festival service with the parades as well. On your behalf, I'd like to welcome Jessica Dalton for preparing and leading this morning's worship. Um, if I can just quickly run through a few of the things that are happening this week. Community coffee will you know, take place in the lounge on Monday and Wednesday, as usual. And on Wednesday at two o'clock, Gretchen's house group will meet at her home and they have Andrew Brazier coming to speak with them. Also on Wednesday at 8 p.m., um, the HHMC and Lay Hill Bible Study Group will be meeting on Zoom. Thursday at 10.30 for 11, the Oyster Club will meet and Reverend Rachel Hawkins will be talking about her trip to Ghana. Now I understand this is one of the sort of few opportunities for the church to actually hear her story about Ghana in full. So even if you don't normally go to Oyster Club and want to hear about Ghana, please go along and the Oyster Club will make you welcome and you can hear Rachel speak. Also on Thursday night at 7.15, the Thursday Fellowship Group will meet in room two and they seem to have a meeting which is entitled Pick a Hymn, which sounds quite interesting. Saturday morning, we have one of our uh, in-person coffee mornings at 10 till 12. And this time it's in all the funds raised with aid of the Macmillan Cancer Support Group. The following Monday, that's the 30th, so not this Monday, but the following Monday, is Sheila Daly's funeral at 11 o'clock here at this church. The community coffee helpers that day will provide drinks for anybody who arrives early and there will be refreshments served in the hall upstairs after the service. Um, right, I think that's the notices, unless anybody else wants to throw any more at me. Can I ask Shalini, do we have anybody greeting us online? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, slight technical problem, getting the microphone. Sorry, just one. It's Andrew Pennycook. He is in very sunny and warm Nuremberg. And I presume it's in yeah. Germany. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Glad to hear you're with us and enjoying the sun. Oh, we've got another one. Joan, Joan Norton, is that? Yeah, Joan Norton. Good morning, everyone. Right. Good morning, Joan. Pleased to have you with us again. Um, Robin, would you be kind enough to play a little music as we prepare our hearts and minds for this morning's service? And then we can receive the uniformed organisations. Thank you. Would you kindly stand, ladies and gentlemen, so that we can receive the guides and brownies? First goof of the day, it's actually the rainbows and the brownies, no guides. 
Please do be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely, as always, to be with you at Hemel. I know that uh, most of you know me, but for those of you who are here this morning, maybe for the first time or aren't here very regularly, my name's Jessica. I'm a local preacher in the Methodist Church in a circuit in West London. I'm very good friends with Andrew, the minister at this church, and his wife Ruth, so sometimes I'm allowed north of the M25 to come and share Sunday morning worship with my friends at Hemel as well. Let's pray together. Some words from Psalm 67. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. Loving and sovereign God, we praise you for your kindness and your generosity. You alone are worthy of our delight and worship. We bring you ourselves this morning in wonder and joy. You have made us worthy in your eyes. Help us to worship you. Amen. Our first hymn is perhaps the most well-known of all harvest hymns and expresses our thanks to God for the gifts of God's creation. So it's number 130, if you are using the books, we plough the fields and scatter.
I should have said at the beginning, especially if you don't always go to church or perhaps you go to a different church, that when I am preaching, I facilitate a very relaxed atmosphere, which I am forced to do by the presence of my three-year-old, who you will hear at the back of church, shouting dinosaur names very loudly. So <laughs> please do not worry about moving about or doing whatever it is you need to do. Everybody is welcome to be themselves here. And know that, I mean, it's not a challenge, but whatever you do probably won't be as loud as the dinosaur names that sometime come into my sermon. But I would rather have the dinosaur names than what I once had when Billy was a bit younger, where I paused in a sermon for what I thought was a moment of reflection. Billy very loudly from the back said, it's the end. <laughs> so the dinosaur names are an improvement. Let's continue in prayer. Praise be to you, O God, the maker of the universe, by whose wisdom we are created and sustained. Praise be to you, O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whose love we are redeemed and forgiven. Praise be to you, O God, the source of all holiness, by whose spirit we are made whole and brought to perfection. Praise be to you, O God, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. In our Sunday service, this is normally when we come to the time where we offer God our prayers of thanksgiving. And of course, this morning, we are particularly mindful of the gifts of harvest. And to my right, we've got hundreds of beautiful gifts that remind us of the gifts of harvest. But of course, including that, there are also lots more things to be thankful for in our lives. The world is full of God's blessings. So instead of our usual prayers this morning, we're going to play a little game of Thanksgiving tennis. So you need to turn to somebody next to you and make a pair. You can make, if their numbers aren't even, you can make a three. That's also fine. Okay, so turn to the person next to you, you've made a pair. And then for just two minutes, you're going to name something little or big that you are grateful for. And then you're going to knock it back to your partner who will do the same, as if you're playing tennis between the two of you. So it can be as big as, I'm thankful for friends, or as little as, I'm thankful for the shopkeeper who smiled at me this morning. So the person who doesn't run out of big and little things to be grateful for is the winner. But I think that most of us can probably keep going between the two of us for two full minutes. So you've got a couple of seconds to fill your minds with things to be thankful for, ready to play. And I will time two minutes, ready, steady, go.
well done, everybody. Let's come back together. And I will say a prayer that lifts all of those things that we've named and gives thanks to God. Generous God, for all the gifts you have given us, for all the places we feel something of your love for us, for all the ways we know your presence with us, we give you thanks and praise. And this morning we pray that you would help us to always be people of gratitude. Amen. We're going to think a lot this morning about harvest being a time of thanksgiving. It also is a time to think about how we can be generous with what we're given. And there's this relationship between our thanksgiving to God for the things we have and then thinking about how we might share what we have with others. Now this morning it looks perhaps most like our sharing and giving of food. But it might also mean giving time to help others or collecting money if and when we have some to spare. And this morning in church, we're collecting money for All We Can, which is the Methodist Development and Relief Agency that work all over the world on lots of different projects to help those who have very little. And we're going to watch a video now before we hear some readings from Scripture that uh, explains one of the projects that All We Can is working on. And it helps us to see that generosity, in whatever form it takes, money, skills, time, giving of our gifts, enables other people to flourish and to enjoy life, to realise their potential and move towards their calling in God. Now, unfortunately, the sound quality of the video when you're watching it on a big screen is not brilliant and the subtitles are quite small. Um, but we're going to give it a go anyway. I think we're going to turn off the lights to help us see the subtitles as best we can. Um, but it, I'm afraid that when you're, it's really uh, the best sound quality is if we all had our own laptops and we were all plugged into headphones. But with that not possible, we should do our best to try um, and listen to what is being said in the video. But um, the pictures also tell a good story and we will come back together at the end. So we're going to watch that now. I was already giving up. God, children, you have to go, be telling people no food to eat. So the best thing I could do is to die. Because I got tired of my children. And everybody is looking up to me and they are not getting anything. My auntie told me, school was not for women. I said, I want to go to school. And she said that she don't have the hay because her time her father was dead. And I saw hatred rising from all anger which caused me to leave home and get into the street. In the context of Liberia, majority of our people are illiterate. After the Civil War, a whole generation have missed out on education. Mothers around here are single mothers, you know? And upbringing of a child, just a single person, and then more, you can't read and write, you're almost like in the dark. I heard about this school through a little girl who called me Auntie. But we can't say no more then Let's start with the art of literacy so you can be able to write your name. Literacy is a bedrock for our organization. I see other literacy as the thread that holds everything together. Help them to be able to find uh, something to do, maybe a job. It builds self-confidence and self-esteem. For those who can read and write, some of them have very brilliant ideas, but they don't see themselves as people who are worthy of any contribution. They don't think that they have anything to offer. And then when people are making decisions, they don't count on them. So most of the uh, benefit that they should have gotten, even from uh, government or other sources, it doesn't reach them. For women to get education skill, it's important. That me not get where my knee. It's good to know what you want to be and what you want to do. So it's good for women to learn to lean your way. Most of what we're hearing from the learners and you know, what we're completing is that to read and write is good, you know, but after that, what next? We are led by the community and the issues uh, impacting them. In fact, they have more ideas better than us. They know exactly their issues. The community has so much. You just need somebody to help them to see clearly what they have and how best to value what they have and make use of it. I graduated from year 2017. 
I got the machine. I started practicing on my own. And I started getting accustomed more, small, small. I started getting strength. Kids who have vocational skills, they can, they, they quickly become independent, generating some funding to help themselves. They are able to advocate for themselves. They make their own decisions. The tutoring job means a lot to me because I said now I'm able to feel myself, help my children with their schooling. You can see me now again. I can sew my clothes. I have one glass kite, one way glass with a shower stepper. And I wore this to service for three years. People who saw it only felt it was a uniform. Not knowing it was the only clothes that I have to wear. And today, I can change clothes any hour, any time. I got free now. Yes, the way you can't put me. I'm giving up. You don't give what you don't have. The significance of the partnership with All We Can, one of the good things is they say to us, we're not here to tell you do this or do that. We see them as a true partner. True partners will work with you in a way that when they are gone, you're much more better than they met you. Chef have caused me today that I can sing. I was a baker, but today I'm not a giver because I'm not only eating my own, I'm also scratching it. Yeah. We invite you to join Shift today to help communities to tailor their journeys and fulfill their potential. It's tough being free. <laughs> I hope that video, um, if you are able to give to the Church Collection today, that video gives you a sense of where that money is going. But I also think what's really important and really interesting in that video is what the woman who has been helped by the work of All We Can says. Because she talks about how now she has been helped, and she has gone on this tailoring course and has learned how to make clothes and sells the clothes that she's made. It's really important to her to talk about how she now gives. So she has been helped by this organisation and she now has an overflowing of that generosity and wants to help others. So there's this kind of, there's this huge thing that we as God's people are invited to be part of, where we give and then that giving multiplies and multiplies. The words of the next song, I hope, will help us to reflect on the message of that video and will prepare us to hear some readings from scripture. So if you are using the hymn book, it's number 255, but the words will be on the screen. The kingdom of God is justice and joy, 255.
We're going to hear two readings from Scripture now. So the first is from the Gospel of Mark, and then the second is from the letter of James. And we'll hear them both, just one after the other. The Gospel reading is taken from Mark chapter 9, beginning to read at verse 30. Jesus predicts his death a second time. They left the place where they were and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus said to the 12 and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not just welcome me, but also the one who sent me. The second reading is from James, chapter 3 verses 13 to 4, 3 to 7 and 8a. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Submit yourselves to God. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Thank you both. There is nothing more satisfying as a child to discovering that your mum has kept all of her school reports. Because of course, when you're very little, you think that your mother must have been terribly well behaved all the time at school and must have never got in trouble for anything, never been sent out of the classroom, never done anything naughty. So it was great when in my grandma's house, 
I think I was probably aged, maybe just a couple of years older than our rainbows here this morning, I discovered that my grandmother, obviously thinking about my joy in the future, had kept every single one of my mum's school reports, and it turned out she was very chatty when she was at school. And I'm my favourite as somebody who was already quite interested in going to church, my very favourite part of her school report, under the heading scripture, which is what they used to call religious education, um, or PSHE, underneath that heading it said, Sarah is virtually silent in discussion. Sometimes I'm unsure if she is present with us in the classroom. <laughs> and I'm 34 now, and I still repeat that back to her regularly. I think about that this morning, because that reading from the Gospel is a little bit like how some of us might like to imagine our parents were in school. Because the disciples are not behaving very well. They're not being what we might call the adults in that situation. Because Jesus asks them what they've been talking about, and they're too ashamed to say, because what they've been arguing about is who will be the greatest. And they're embarrassed to have been found out talking about something that perhaps sounds so silly or so foolish. And it reminds me a little bit of when you are in school, and I'm sure this never happens to any of you at the front, I'm sure it never happened to any of you who are perhaps a little bit older, when you have been chatting with your friend and the teacher turns around and says something like, do you want to share what you're saying with the class? <laughs> and you absolutely don't want to share what you were saying at all. And that's exactly the situation the disciples find themselves in, in our reading this morning, because they know that what they were talking about was not quite perhaps the attitude that they should have had. And then Jesus says something that is very radical. It was very radical then, and it's very radical now. He says, if you want to be the greatest you must be the very last. If you want to be first, you must be last. Of course, that doesn't really make any sense to us. What could that possibly mean? If you want to be first, you must be last. Surely, if you want to be at the front of the queue, you must be at the front of the queue, not the very last person in the queue waiting for whatever it is that you're all waiting for. But Jesus is adamant that those amongst us who want to be great, who want to be like Jesus, must seek not to be the first, not to be the best, but to be the last. And this is a very difficult thing for us to get our heads round. But harvest allows us to engage with something that underpins much of our life of Christian faith. Because like we've said this morning, we celebrate the incredible generosity of God in the world that we have been given to live in. We think of all the wonderful things that we have been given by God, big things and small. And then there's an invitation for us all to think seriously about how we might share this generosity with those who are unable to enjoy it. And of course, our donations of food are a really good example. I don't know how many of you, when you turned to your partner, gave thanks for something that you like to eat or some food that you particularly enjoy. But we think of the things that we have been given to enjoy that are that are part of our food, we might have given thanks that we have plenty to eat or for something that we especially enjoy. And then at harvest, we're invited to move further from just giving thanks and sharing that food with people who have very little to eat. And something that always encourages me when I put something into the food bank basket at my local supermarket is that people give lots of things off the list that the food bank says they need, which is really good, but sometimes people put in treats as well because they recognise that those are the things that bring a little moment of dignity or joy to people's lives. So they might put in some kind of fancy herbal tea or some particularly nice biscuits or some chocolates so that people can also experience a moment of joy and thanksgiving in their lives. And in doing so, we recognise each other's common humanity. So this pattern of celebrating God's love and the, thing God, the things that God gives us and then hopefully overflowing so much with that love that we want to share it, that we want other people to enjoy it, is a pattern that reappears again and again in scripture and in the Christian faith. And it's a cause of much joy because it's a beautiful thing to be part of and because we have been given so much and what we have been given is so beautiful. But it's also a cause sometimes for sadness because when we look at the generosity of God, we can see in our world how poorly we have sometimes stewarded those gifts. 
and how so many people are prevented from knowing or taking hold of them. We are so grateful to God at Harvest for the gift of food and the foods we particularly enjoy. But of course, we're also called to remember that there are many people who do not have enough to eat and do not have any choice over what they eat. As humans, we're often not very good at sharing. I was paid back for my recollection of my mother's school reports by my mother reminding me of something that happened when I was four, when I had a particularly splendid green silk dress with a lacy collar in my dressing up box. And my friend came home from school and we played dressing up. And Ad had a turn in the dress. And then my friend wanted a turn as well. And I was so angry at the thought that she would have to have a turn with my dress and I wouldn't be wearing it, that I shut myself in the bathroom until my friend went home. <laughs> but actually all of us, children and grown-ups alike, are sometimes not very good at sharing. And that's why we find it hard to understand those words of Jesus Christ in the gospel this morning. Whoever wants to be la first must be last of all and servant of all. Because in lots of conscious ways and unconscious ways, we actually have what our reading from James describes as envy and ambition. James says, you want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. I suspect nobody here has committed murder because they want something and don't have it. James is talking in extremes. But we become angry because there's something we want and we don't have it. You covet something, you want it, and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. We often want to take more and more for ourselves. Perhaps because of an anxiety that there won't be enough for us. That's a bit like me with my dress as a child. Of course, she wasn't going to take the dress home. The dress was mine. But the anxiety of her wearing it just for 15 minutes was 15 minutes when I wouldn't be wearing it. And I just couldn't tolerate it. Perhaps we want to protect ourselves from a fear of loss. Perhaps we want something that we really can't have, so we desperately seek something else to fill that gap. And we can find it very hard to be generous, especially if our experience of others has not been one where we have been shown generosity. By and large, we can only do what has been done to us. And if people haven't been generous to us, it may be very hard for us to be generous. We can find ourselves being greedy, but of course, greed and envy and wanting things for ourselves doesn't spring from nowhere. There might be something within us that we are trying to fill, something we are trying to heal, and we're invited to attend to those things in ourselves. When we notice that we don't want to share, when we notice that we're envious, when we notice that we want more and more for ourselves, we might ask ourselves, what is that feeling about? We do need to face the reality, though, that the resources of the world, these gifts from God, which should be enough for everyone all over the world, here in Hemel Hempstead, in the video that we saw in Liberia, and in places across the globe, there should be enough for everyone to live in plenty. But these gifts are not justly shared. And that injustice often stems from envy and greed and wanting to keep things for ourselves. But this morning in the readings from scripture, we're called to something different. To put aside that desire to not share, to keep things for ourselves, and move towards this gratitude and this generosity. James writes it, to turn to the wisdom from above, that is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Now that's all very nice, that we could try really hard to be better at sharing, to be better at being generous. But of course, there's a big question. How do we do that? First, perhaps we need to be honest with ourselves. Not judgmental and not unkind to ourselves, but honest. Where might we be taking more and more for ourselves? Where might we be jealous or envious? Where might we not be very good at sharing? And I'm talking because it's harvest, obviously about the material goods of the harvest, about food and, and about money. But also, we can be envious and anxious about others' relationships or others' gifts, their skills and talents, or the love that others have. So we might want to ask ourselves, 
Where are we frightened of not having enough? And where that fear of not having enough isn't grounded in reality, but in our kind of fantasies of what the world is like, then we might try to be more conscious of those feelings, to notice them when they arise, and to try and challenge them. How can we choose to do something different? To notice that we are feeling envious, to notice that we are feeling that we don't want to share, but instead of acting on them, choose something different, the mercy, the peace, and the gentleness that James speaks of, generosity. But there's a big danger here, that we think that this is all to do with us. And then, of course, we get a bit of a saviour complex, and we think that we are responsible for saving the world. And if only we individually could just be a little bit nicer, a little bit more generous, then everything will be okay. But this isn't just about our lives as individuals living and working in the world, but about the systems and institutions we are part of, participate in, or depend upon some of which we have no choice to engage with. Banks, governments, and economies. I read an article recently about a man who decided to give up money. And I thought, goodness, that's terribly impressive. And then, of course, you read the article, and in giving up money, it turned out that his friends were buying a lot of drinks down the pub for him. And that somebody else, he was growing all his own food, which was very laudable. But, of course, if you give up money, there are a lot of other people who are having to fill the gap for you. There are a lot of things in the world that we have no choice but to be part of. But some of those systems are corrupt. They distribute wealth unequally and allow millions of people to suffer in hunger and thirst and slavery. Those big businesses and those corporations don't care about people in the way that that reading from Mark and the reading from James asks us to do. And that also comes from this desire to have more and more but on a huge scale. So we need to remember that whilst we must change the things in our lives that would allow us to be more generous and allow us to be more giving, there's also a bigger picture that we are part of. And we can be an instrument for change there too. What we buy, where we invest, wherever we spend our money, we can say something about the world we want to live in. We can hold businesses to account and we can campaign about the way that the world's systems are organized. Some things we have no choice about, but without other things we may be able to act and think creatively or choose to do something in a different way. So in this sense, harvest is much bigger than what we see in church on a Sunday like today. It's a real call to engage with justice and to think about the way we live, to look inside ourselves, but also to look at the world, seeking out places where we might speak truth and challenge the systems that we live in. Now, we are, all have different lives. We all have different resources and limitations on our money, our time, and our responsibilities. So the way that we seek to live differently will look different for each of us. And it's not an easy, quick answer, but an invitation to live our whole lives in a different way. How can we celebrate the good things that God has given us? How can we celebrate the abundance of God's love and provision? How can we make space for what we did in those two minutes earlier and give thanks for the things that are shared with us? And how also can we try to share that abundance, to share that goodness with others? What can we do in our own lives that would allow us to be more generous, that would allow us to be more giving, that would allow us to seek not to be first, but to be the servant of all and to be people who give? And how can we carry that same message to the world and to the systems that we are all part of? Those are big questions. We're going to sing again. And our next song is really our prayer of confession, where we acknowledge that we don't always get everything right, where we do lots of things wrong and we wish we had done them differently. And we know that God forgives us when we come to God and we ask for God's help in doing things differently in the future. And perhaps this morning, we might think particularly about those times when we struggle to be generous and when we struggle to share what we have. So if you are using the books, it's number 419. Almighty God, we come to make confession. 419.
We come to our time where we pray for the needs of the world. And there is a response when I say, Lord, in your mercy, if you would like, please respond, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace and peace, we pray for the people we saw in our video this morning, for all those living in Liberia, and for all those seeking to serve others living in poverty. We remember those working to ensure everyone has enough, those feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, healing the sick, visiting those in prison. We pray that with your help, we might do the same. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice, we pray for all those living in places of violence and conflict, for those in the midst of war, those whose lives look unrecognisable as a result of fighting and unrest, for those whose homes have been destroyed, for those kidnapped and taken hostage, for those grieving and terrified, for those forced against their will to fight, and for the injured and the dying. We hold before you the people of Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Sudan, and those in war zones across the world. And for those who experience conflict, but behind closed doors and in their own homes, who live in fear in the places they should be safest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, we pray for those who seek to lead and influence those who make decisions that impact the lives of your people. For our government here, and for all world leaders and politicians, and those in opposition. For those who act as role models, who promote ways of being and acting in the world. May all these people be guided by your wisdom and holiness, and motivated by your justice and your grace. May they be well advised, and not give way to self-interest and greed, but pursue mercy, peace, and gentleness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, for the sick and the dying, the grieving and the lonely, the prisoner and the condemned, the outcast and the despised, for those whose voices often remain unheard, for children, the elderly, the disabled, for those whose suffering is known only to you. And in a moment of quiet, we remember before you those who have asked us if we might think of them in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for ourselves. You know what we are called to do. You know the sadness and the joy we face in the week to come. Open our hearts to your grace. Help us to be people of mercy, peace and gentleness. Help us to reflect and to be open to your wisdom. Help us to change the things we need to change and help us to seek you in all things. And we lift these prayers and the prayers of our hearts in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. 
In a moment, we're going to sing our final hymn. And then after our final hymn, we'll stay standing, as we often do if you're able, for the blessing. And then after the blessing, if you st still stay standing, if you're able and willing, and then our rainbows and our guides will come and collect their flags and we'll process out. And once they've processed out, we'll sit down again. Okay, so we'll stay standing after the blessing to allow our young people to process out. Okay, our last hymn speaks of that desire to thank God for the gifts of God and to ask for God's help in sharing those with the world. So if you're using the book, it's number 167, Colours of Day Dawn Into the Mind, 167. Loving God, in all that we do, say and are, may we know and share your grace and the gifts of mercy, gentleness and peace. And as we seek to follow you more nearly, may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us now and always. Amen. <laughs>